Good morning, Meg. Thank you. Thank you, Meg, and uh, good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for, for coming this morning. Uh, the hundreds here uh, in the room uh, at an early time after a long evening, I'm sure. Um, I'd like to thank those of you who are on the internet watching us streaming from your home or from your office or more likely from school uh, <laughs> for allowing this time for me uh, to share with you some of the observations from my vantage in the industry. Ours is an industry with humble beginnings, an industry that has grown dramatically in membership, in impact, and in influence over the years. Nevertheless, we try to, we try to keep it real as we push boundaries and try to do no harm. To illustrate this, the evolution of DICE when it first began, oh, there we go, uh, more than 20 years ago, I heard that maybe five or six people watched it on AOL or GeoCities uh, streaming or something back then. Uh, but now times are different. The industry is now, the industry then was new and it has grown. But I just gotta say, what's up with those haircuts, guys? Seriously, Ted, I think you're in the room. Back then, back then gaming was almost a, almost a secret activity. You'd come across other gamers at a comic book shop or at a Blockbusters, and you'd walk up and you'd hear someone say, did you say Doom? And you'd start to have a conversation, and then the connection was made. In some cases, those connections have lasted a lifetime and have even led to creating a livelihood in this industry. As they say, we've come a long way. And looking out on all of you now, it's great to see familiar faces and new ones here at DICE to see how you have shaped the industry that we all love so much. I don't know if any of us could have predicted how far we'd have, we would have come by this time. Today, competitive gaming fills up stadiums with thousands, tens of thousands of people watching. There are dedicated streaming services based around watching other people play video games. And, and, and Ninja, <laughs> gets on the cover of ESPN magazine. I mean, what the heck's going on here? Our grandparents are now playing Sudoku on their tablets. Sports stars and rappers tweet out their experiences in playing games. R&B singers talk about how they can't live without their consoles, and it's the one thing that they always bring on tour. Saturday Night Live had a sketch recently where the actors played video game characters. MPD data shows us gaming in the United States, just in the US, was over $35 billion in 2018. Our industry broke the record it set in 2017. 2018 was really a good year, and at a global level, that figure is closer to $140 billion. Insomniac's Marvel Spider-Man, the video game, had a bigger opening weekend than the 2017 movie. The standard used to be making a game to follow a movie. More and more now, we see the possibility that the characters that we create can transcend our medium and be part of other forms of art. In fact, Uncharted is currently under development to become a major motion picture. Looking around, I couldn't be prouder of all that we've accomplished, all that you've accomplished, folks in this room. Our industry is at an inflection point, a moment when we're shedding our youth and becoming a cultural lodestone. The community has grown because gamers, gamers don't grow out of gaming anymore. We've got a lot more folks in this industry with gray hair, myself included. Gamers are everyone. We do not see games as childish things that need to be put away. We embrace gaming as the art form of our generation, as the most powerful form of expression. For so many, gaming has become a tremendous part about the way in which we enrich our lives. And we, as the game makers, have the opportunity to continue to push for new perspectives, new heroes and heroines, whose lives we can embody, if only for a few moments, or in some instances, for a few years. We can continue to bring together new friends and old over vast distances in different life circumstances. We've got an incredible opportunity in what is one of the biggest inflection points in the history of gaming. But, as to quote Peter Parker's Uncle Ben, 
with great power, there must also come great responsibility. As we have this tremendous moment, I want to share with you a few of the biggest lessons we have learned through game development. Number one, quality above all. Our fans trust us to make amazing gaming experiences for them, and we must fulfill that promise. And if this takes more time, we have to give it more time. New IP isn't always easy, but it's always necessary. Whether taking a risk on a new title or to promote a new system, we have to take chances to grow and learn and continue to push our industry forward. Finally, we can't predict how people will play, but play they will. We have the chance to continue to grow this audience, to welcome new voices in the fan base and in the development community, to broaden our tent for gaming. Thanks to many of you in this room, the industry has gone through tectonic shifts that have simultaneously pushed the technology, pushed the creativity, and developed entire new markets. There are new economics around gaming. New business models have surfaced. New ways to monetize content, including free-to-play and games as a service. But as is always the case with creative pursuits, there must be a keen balance struck between monetization and the user experience. We never want to lose sight of that fact. And if we do, our audience will correct us. Looking back at a few major milestones, it seems like it was all given, but as we know, there is blood, there is sweat, there are sleepless nights, and maybe even a few tears. Right, Corey? That go into creating something truly earth-shattering. We need look no further than to our friends at Rockstar, who launched a little title back in 2013, way back then, that forever changed people's relationships with games. GTA V has been one of the top revenue-generating titles every year since it launched. A relentless pursuit of quality, expansion, and really engaging experiences are hallmarks of the games developed by Rockstar, and we are all better for their trailblazing. Truly, nothing like this industry has ever seen before. Bravo. A little further back, in the recesses of our minds back in 2011, a Swedish developer launched a sandbox game, reminiscent of Legos. Minecraft made people think a little differently about games. Suddenly, they were a tool for creating and collaborating, parents and kids playing together. Kids had land parties, building endless worlds together. Minecraft forever changed the industry for the better. At minimum, it helped us all think differently about what graphic fidelity means. And it's not just software that drives innovation. The best-selling console of 2018 in the US was the Nintendo Switch. Nintendo took a massive risk when they brought this to the market. People thought Nintendo might one day be out of the hardware business. People would say things like, kids play games on mobile phones and tablets, dedicated portable gaming is dead and gone. But as I've said it before, never underestimate Nintendo. And boy, did they ever deliver. Not only with innovative, easy to use, fun to take along gaming, they also launched it with a game of the year. All of us are better for their efforts. And innovation is coming from any size company, from every corner of the world, whether it's New York, Stockholm, Tokyo, or even Cary, North Carolina. Epic may not have been a household name a few years ago, but it sure is now. One really can't overstate the effect of Fortnite in the world of 2018. It is without a doubt a global phenomenon whose impact will be felt for several years. Once again, game makers have changed the economics of the industry. Fortnite Battle Royale showed how free-to-play could be done by creating a compelling social experience that drives millions of friends to go into that island, drop into that island, over and over again, and again, and again. Changing tack for just a moment, I'd like to take a time right now to answer 
a question that I saw on Reddit, for those of you who read Reddit, uh, after my first appearance on stage at E3 in 2014, under the headline, who the hell is this guy? <laughs> it took me a lot to read that Reddit thread. <laughs> it will thicken one's skin. Um, well, in answer to that question, though, you can call me a, a prospector, an early prospector from the fifth generation of video gaming. I started with PlayStation back in 1996 and spent years in Tokyo, London, California. So I've been around for a little while. Let's hear it for 32-bit gaming. <laughs> Remember when that was a thing? I started in Japan with a team that was in charge of localizing Western games to bring them to the Japanese market. You can imagine what that challenge was. Not unlike trying to bring American automobiles into the Japanese market. Things became a lot more straightforward then when I moved to London. There I was focused on broadening our offering of partnering with key Japanese developers to bring their content to Europe. Uh, I like to other with some American publishers as well. We were the official publishing partners for Namco, Square, Disney, Sega, and a handful of others during my time there. And I think those efforts helped further globalize gaming and make our worldwide community come a, bit a little, little bit closer. After many years in London, I assumed the role of president of Sony Computer Entertainment Japan, my first time leading a sales and marketing operation. And I must admit, I was a little hesitant to attempt that leap, leaping the, uh, the species bar from development into marketing. You know, could I stick the landing? But my time in that role, starting in Japan and laterally in America, helped me to understand better and appreciate and love what it is we do for our fans and our stakeholders, whether they be retailers, uh, journalists, and others. Today, back in PD, as chairman of Worldwide Studios, I'm proud to work with some of the most talented creators and some of the best studios in the world, making some of the greatest games anywhere, if I may humbly say so. Games that innovate, excite, and when we get it right, we raise the bar. This focus on quality was instilled in me during my early years at Sony, which was well before PlayStation was a twinkle in Ken Kutaragi's eye. Way back then in the 80s, I worked directly for Sony founder and chairman, Akio Morita. Quality above all. Morita-san launched Sony to enable technologists, engineers, dreamers to work together to find out what they were passionate about and to do the things that others do not. By the 80s, Sony was riding high because of the spirit and focus from Morita-san on quality and innovation. Morita-san taught me that quality of the products was fundamental if we are to exceed our customers' expectations. That even when pushing technological boundaries, we must always make delighting our fans the key priority. He would say we must forever push innovation even if it meant murdering our darlings. We have to make our products obsolete before other people do, because they will. Mortison understood well the innovator's dilemma and grappled with it constantly. Of course, times change, but the cascade of challenges is relentless. Many of you know that PlayStation 2 was an industry triumph. It remains one of the best-selling consoles of all time, but coming off the heels of that was PlayStation 3, a, uh, a stark moment of hubris in the nearly 25 years of PlayStation history. As we sometimes call it, PS3 was our Icarus moment. That was when I returned from London to join Sony Computer Entertainment Japan, and for our business, the fall was sharp. We hadn't listened to our customers. We created a devilish development environment. We reacted too slowly and our network was underdeveloped. And worst of all, if you remember, was the price point. While the PlayStation 3 and our fight to stay relevant has been well covered, what wasn't as well covered 
was the call we made at that time to transform our company into what we are today. We doubled our efforts to develop incredible games and strengthen our partnerships for the next generation. We listened to developers and gamers. We listened to this guy, Mark Cerny. He's here somewhere, I think. We created PS4, a console for developers as much as it was for fans. We focused on the quality of our games, on making titles that would stand the test of time, the way that the best pieces of art often do. Games like The Last of Us, Uncharted, Infamous. During that era, we also began work on many of our more recent highly acclaimed titles, including God of War, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Bloodborne. With each move, we listened to our fans and respected our founders. Always Mori Desan in the back of our minds. We focused on delivering innovation and quality across our portfolio. As a member of our senior management team, we would discuss how to provide the freedom and time to our creators to make games into incredible stories and experiences for our fans. To bring to life entertainment that would engage and inspire. But also, we remember real artists ship. We have to meet expectations for our fans and for our company. We seek to strike the right balance between our developers and our business while living up to the promise we make to our fans. I think it works because at the end, we really all have the same goal. No one wants to make a game hardly anyone plays and no one finishes. We all want as many people as possible to experience our creations. Sometimes that means adding time, doubling down, and truly believing in a team that can take a beloved franchise to a new and more powerfully expressive level, a la God of War. Sometimes it means choosing to do the new thing. New IP isn't always easy, but it's always necessary. Imagine for a moment that a game studio comes up to you they want to make a game set in a post-apocalyptic Colorado, where the heroine protagonist fights against, wait for it, robot dinosaurs. Or you could go with a title that's more similar to what that studio has made in the past, a supernatural shooter that brings in werewolves and a few of the first-person shooting mechanics that studio is known for. We looked at Guerrilla Games' proposal, heard what they were saying. They wanted to take a new direction. So they solicited pitches from their own studio, from internal, and received more than 30 pitches, including an idea from their art director that became Horizon Zero Dawn. The world was a complete 180 from what that studio had delivered previously. We had begun working with Guerrilla way back when to have a first-person shooter called Killzone developed for the launch of PlayStation 3. The studio didn't have any experience in open-world action RPGs. Herman Hulst, the studio director, pitched both Horizon and the title they had polished to readiness, the werewolf thing, and then pulled the group, the studio, and developers and leadership about what they wanted to do. All hands went up for Horizon. Some people have said, no one would be interested in robot dinosaurs. You know who you are. Yet again, creativity wins. We trusted our team, and over the ensuing years in development, Guerrilla demonstrated that great studios with a focus on making great games can create significant titles in new genre. And sometimes our studios must make great games that push our platform forward. Our PlayStation VR platform is one such example from 2016. With VR, we're still learning a lot, all the time. In many ways, we still don't even have the right vocabulary or syntax to describe properly the VR experience. We use terms like immersion and sense of presence and immersive, but the descriptors are still clumsy, and much of VR is 1.0, and it still feels experimental. But in the end, if you don't try it, you can't know it. So that's the big challenge. 
We are starting to see progress towards VR 2.0 games, the software. And we are quite happy with Japan Studios, little robot who could, Astro, from Astrobot Rescue Mission. Astrobot utilized the VR medium to redefine what a platformer could be, and to very good effect. A game of this quality, arriving in the first generation of a new technology, helps us lay a foundation for everyone to build upon. The talent in this room and those watching from around the world will develop the new ideas and bring new concepts to life and further this experience. I'm confident of that. Now is the time for us all to create things that we've never been able to do before. To experiment and to try and to fail and to try and to fail again. To come up with new rich experiences that will amaze and delight our fans. This is, without a doubt, an exciting time to be in VR. And I can't wait to see what all of you will deliver to that platform. But I want you to remember that no matter what comes next, we really can't predict how people will play. But people will play. We have a unique position in the industry. We have a unique industry in and of itself. We don't make cars, we don't make refrigerators. We make games. We make experiences that entertain and inspire. We lift people out of their daily lives and give them the opportunity to become an astronaut exploring far off planets, or an adventurer looking for lost treasures, or a cowboy needing a horse. And one thing I can assure you from more than 20 years in this business the technology will change. We will have new, more advanced ways to play, updated graphics, seamless interfaces. I've seen our platforms transform from playing compact discs, uh, which we don't anymore, actually, um, to becoming home entertainment hubs that pull an entire digital storefront right into your living room. But through it all, it's people's love of games, and they have always loved to play. It is our responsibility then to continue to broaden the tent, to continue to ensure that everyone can play. All are welcome here. We must keep striving to make games more accessible, as Xbox has done with its adaptive controller, and what we have had the privilege to do with our software titles. Naughty Dog has opened the door for us with its several accessibility modes. They heard the call from our fans with accessibility needs, who are some of our biggest fans and most devoted that we could ever hope to know. But they couldn't do simple things. They, they weren't able to mash a button or to meet a simple time cue. Items that weren't crucial to the story, but inhibited their experience. And led by the dreamers, the creators, the innovators at our studios around the world, we are looking for ways to build accessibility options into all of our games. This is important work. We need the developer community to help us with this task. As an industry, we must lead from the front. We must continue to make gaming more open to everyone. Open to all gamers of good faith and good humor. All are welcome. Our industry brings joy and friendship, not animosity and divisiveness. Surely there's more than enough divisiveness in the world today. As you will build the next generation of games, all of you will, and I hope that we will cherish the promise made to our fans that we bring play, we bring fun. We must admit, this has got to be the best job in the world. Before wrapping up, I want to share a moment from last year that I think highlights how we can all work together to raise the community together. Girls make games. For those of you who don't know, Layla Shabir started Girls Make Games to provide young women the opportunity to learn how to make games over a three-week summer camp. We've had the privilege of hosting this camp for the past two years on the PlayStation campus. And we've also had the honor to host the day when all of the best teams from across the country come together to present their final ideas. They call it Demo Day. This past year on Demo Day, 
We saw horror games and platformers and games that took head on complex social issues like bullying. And each of those games came uniquely from a perspective and experience that only a new cohort could provide for us. Our industry came together to celebrate these young, aspiring game makers. Leadership from Nintendo, Xbox, and PlayStation were present on campus in celebration of girls making games. I'm proud of what we demonstrated that day and what it means for our industry. And spend 10 minutes with Leila Shabir or the campers at Girls Make Games, and you will know that our future is bright. And this is why this talk is called Beyond Generations. Let us all be allies to one another, never adversaries. Sure, sure, we will all compete for attention to further this industry, but we do so to keep the video game landscape vibrant and essential. We have the power to bring joy, inspiration, respite. We have the ability to transport people to new worlds, provide for them superpowers. As developers, we really don't compete against one another. We all craft art. And art is founded on the creative, not the competitive. There's a proverb that comes to mind as I think about what we can accomplish together, now especially as so much around, of us, around us changes. The best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time to plant a tree is today. So what will you plant today? What seed of an idea will you act on and move forward with? What passion project is sitting on a shelf while you're toiling over something you don't really love? Maybe take a minute and think about building the game you want to play or the game you need to build. Maybe that game will be the next industry changing inflection point. I'm looking to all of you to make us do better, be better. Thank you so much for inviting me here to be today with all of you. I'm humbled for the honor, and I can't wait to see what happens next. Thanks.